Today's video is sponsored by Brilliant. Have you ever wondered why in calculus class every angle is measured in radians? Well, in fact, there's a really good reason for that. And it all boils down to the derivatives of the trigonometric functions and how these derivatives have really nice relationships when you use radians, but not so nice when you use degrees. So our goal for today is to give one example of this not niceness for derivatives using degrees. In particular, we'll find the derivative with respect to x of sine of x degrees. Now, we're going to need a tool for that, and that tool is the limit as theta goes to zero of sine of theta degrees over theta degrees. And we'll prove this, but in order to prove this, we need a certain figure. So let's get that picture on the board. If you're looking for a free and easy way to learn about calculus, check out brilliant.org. Are you ready to elevate your intellect and embark on a journey of discovery? Dive into a world of knowledge and ignite your intellect with Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform that's as engaging as it is effective. Brilliant offers interactive, hands-on courses designed to make you not just understand, but truly master concepts in math, science, computer science, and more. You'll be able to complete whole topics gradually in as little as 15 minutes per day and learn anywhere, anytime, on your phone, tablet, or computer. And Brilliant will support you every step of the way. Brilliant makes learning more like a game, with fun features that let you challenge yourself and compete with others. No matter what skill level you're at, Brilliant will help you improve. If you're enjoying this video and want to brush up on calculus, or maybe learn it for the first time, Brilliant's a great place to do that. Brilliant can help you learn calculus all the way from the very, very beginning to multivariable calculus and differential equations. Brilliant makes learning dynamic, engaging, and most importantly, effective. Treat yourself this winter to a unique hands-on experience by going to brilliant.org slash Michael Penn for a 30-day free trial, and the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual subscription. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. So our picture is going to start with the unit circle. Next, we'll make a ray emanating from the origin that makes an angle of theta degrees from the x-axis, the positive x-axis. So that makes this point up here cosine of theta degrees comma sine of theta degrees. Next up, we'll introduce two vertical line segments. They both start at the x-axis but one of them ends at this intersection point between our ray and the circle. So that'll kind of obviously intersect at a point cosine theta comma sine theta. And then the next one will start at this point one zero, and thus, since it's vertical, it's tangent to the circle, and then it'll intersect our ray at the point one comma tangent theta. And that's in fact where tangent gets its name. But that being said, we can calculate that this is tangent theta by similar triangles. Observe that this small triangle and this large triangle are similar simply by, uh, you could use a number of theorems, but maybe the angle, angle, angle theorem. So anyway, you can calculate that that y coordinate or the height of that triangle is tangent theta. But now notice that we kind of get an obvious inequality built out of this whole setup. And that obvious inequality is that the area of the small triangle is less than or equal to the area of the sector of the circle, which is less than or equal to the area of the large triangle. Because, well, observe that this sector of the circle is completely contained in the large triangle, and it completely contains the small triangle. But now we can simply use the formula for the area of a triangle, one-half base times height, to calculate the areas of these triangles. So the area of the small triangle, well, one-half base times height, the base is cosine theta, the height is sine theta. We can see that by that coordinate. So this area is cos theta times sine theta over 
2. And I should say here, these are all in degrees, although I'm leaving the degree out just, you know, to make it a little bit less messy. Okay, nice. But now, what about the area of a sector of a circle? Well, we're going to start with the area of the entire circle, which is pi r squared. The radius here is simply 1, so the area of the whole circle is pi. But then, what proportion of the circle do we have? Well, in order to cover this entire circle, our angle theta would need to be 360 degrees. So, since we've got theta degrees, which is probably less than 360, the proportion of the circle we have is, well, it's going to be exactly theta divided by 360. So here we have theta times pi over 360. And then what about the area of that large triangle? Well, again, by 1 half base times height, we'll have 1 half times tangent theta. But I'm going to write that as sine of theta over 2 times cosine theta, as tangent is sine over cosine. Okay, so that's starting to look good. So next up what I'll do is I'll multiply this entire thing by 2. So that's going to have the effect of getting rid of those 2's which were in the denominator, and it'll change this 360 to 180. Next up, I'm going to divide everything by sine theta. So that's going to give me cosine theta is less than or equal to pi over 180 times theta over sine theta, which is in turn less than or equal to 1 over cosine theta. Next up, I'll multiply every part of this inequality by 180 over pi. So that's going to give us 180 over pi times cosine theta is less than or equal to theta over sine theta, which in turn is less than or equal to 180 over pi times cosine theta. So finally, what I'll do is then I'll invert this inequality. That is, I'll take the reciprocal of all parts of this inequality. But taking the reciprocal of inequality changes the order of the inequality. So as I take the reciprocal, I'll move this right-hand term to the left and vice versa. So that'll give me pi over 180 times cosine theta is less than or equal to sine of theta degrees over theta degrees. Now I'm introducing the degrees again which in turn is less than or equal to pi over 180 times cos theta. Okay, great. But now let's take the limit as theta goes to zero and observe that as theta goes to zero on the ends, we end up with pi over 180 times cosine of zero, but it's well known that cosine of zero is one. So we get that pi over, we get pi over 180 on this left, and we get pi over 180 on this right. But then by the squeeze theorem, that must be what the limit of the middle term is as well. So that means we've got our tool over here. The limit as theta goes to zero of sine of theta degrees over theta degrees is pi over 180. Okay, so now let's use this to find our derivative of sine of x degrees. So in order to find this derivative, we'll use the limit definition. So the derivative of sine of x degrees will be the limit as h goes to zero of sine of x plus h minus sine of x all over h, where of course I have degrees inside of those sine functions on the right-hand side, but I'm appending that just for neatness. So next up what I'll do is I'll use the sum angle formula for this sine of x plus h degrees. So that'll leave us something like this. We have this limit as h goes to zero, and then we'll have sine of x times cosine of h, and then that'll be added to cosine of x 
times sine of h, and then we subtract sine of x, and then this is all over h. Sorry, this should have been an h right there. Okay, so now we're gonna split this into pieces. So we're gonna take this term and kind of keep it on its own, and then these two terms on the end we'll put together. Let's observe that those two terms on the end contain a sine of x. Furthermore, I'm gonna split this into two limits. You might say that that seems a little bit like cheating, but both limits exist, so it's okay. And we'll see that in hindsight. So let's see, this blue term, so we can factor a cosine of x out, and we're left with the limit as h goes to zero of sine of h degrees over h degrees. I'll put the h degrees back in now. And then we'll have plus sine of x times the limit as h goes to zero of, now we have cosine of h minus one over h. Okay, great. And now we're gonna take this second term and multiply by cosine of h plus one over cosine of h plus one. And sort of while we do that, let's observe that this first term is easily evaluated by our tool over here, which we just derived. And in fact, this is pi over 180. So, so far we have pi over 180 times cosine of x degrees, and then we'll have plus sine of x times the limit as h goes to zero of, well, let's kind of do this on the side. So multiplying out, this turns into cosine squared of h minus one, which is negative sine squared of h, which I can in fact write as negative sine of h times sine of h, and that's what I'm gonna do here. But I'll take the minus sign and then I'll bring it out here. So there we've got this minus sign here, and then we can write this as sine of h degrees over h degrees times sine of h degrees over cosine of h degrees plus one. But now we can use our tool again. So observe that this bit will approach pi over 180, this denominator approaches two, whereas this numerator approaches zero. So that means this whole second term simply approaches zero because we have that numerator approaching zero and everything else is approaching a non-zero real number. So in the end, that leaves us with this single term, pi over 180 times cosine of x degrees. So there we have it. The the derivative of the sine of x degrees is pi over 180 times the cosine of x degrees. And using very, very similar methods, you can calculate the derivative of all of the other trig functions if their arguments are in degrees. And what you'll see is that they're not nearly as nice as what we get when we use radians. And that's a good place to stop.